Um, yeah, so I don't have a clever name. Um, bas basically, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, the legislature went into an extraordinary session and they passed um, they passed a law that had a that had a lot of different parts, and they passed um, a budget bill. Um, and I'll I'll talk a little bit about the budget bill. Uh, I think at one point, if it, if it's helpful, um, I, I don't think any any of the laws changed their names. So frankly, I think that the eviction moratorium is still called CIFA, um, even though it uh, it is changed in here. But let's just do a um, overview. Um, so the basic like top line is that uh, tenants who have faced a hardship um, will be able to um, delay their case uh, in, until um, January uh, 15th, 2022. Um, the law also, I don't know if anyone here works outside of New York City, um, but the, um, in case people work in places like Yonkers or in parts of Nassau County or, or Suffolk, um, not all the places in New York State opted into the state's program. Um, and that meant that the people in those localities did not have the protections that were contained in the ERAP law. Um, and so one of the things the new uh, law did was extend those protections to the tenants in those localities. Um, as I said, there's more money. Um, there's the state put up some money for back rent um, and for two different um, for two different uh, categories. Um, and the Tenant Safe Harbor Act um, has been extended until January 15, 2022. Um, and I'm going to go into all of these things as as we go on. Um, so. Um, if so, as you remember, back in December of 2020, um, the legislature went into session and passed an eviction moratorium law that was that was based on the um, on what the federal government had done, which was it wasn't a straight moratorium. Um, it said that if you were a tenant um, and you fill out a hardship declaration. Um, that stops your case from moving forward, and that that is true. Uh, whether your case is at the very beginning of it, pre-filing, all the way to uh, the point at which the marshal is coming to your door, at any point that you submit the hardship declaration, your case stops. Um, so between, and then the Supreme Court came in, and the Supreme Court said that particular thing, the the fact that the landlords couldn't. Uh, challenge a hardship declaration violated their due process rights. Um, uh, it was a it was not a fully briefed decision. It was a decision on uh, the landlords asking for an emergency stay. They had actually lost their case in the district court, and I think they're about to lose the case in the Second Circuit. Um, but the Supreme Court. Uh, as I said, on a case that was briefed, um, unlike usual Supreme Court cases, which take months of briefing, um, there were a couple of motions and then they decided uh, at, in the dead of night, uh, literally in the dead of night. Um, but it was a three, unlike many Supreme Court decisions, the majority decision was three paragraphs. And the only thing they complained about in that decision was landlords couldn't um, challenge hardship declarations. So when the legislature came back, they addressed the Supreme Court's uh, concern by saying that declarations can now be challenged. Um, all the landlord needs is a good faith basis for belief that the tenant didn't face a hardship. Um, as always, nuisance cases, and they've added something, cases where the tenant has intentionally caused property damage, those cases can move forward. Um, the uh, I think that the reason they put in this a tenant has intentionally caused property damage be, is because one of the plaintiffs of the lawsuit challenging the law um, testified in court um, that her let her tenants are destroying her property, but it's a single family home and no one la allowed her to file a nuisance case because part of the nuisance definition is that you're um, uh, damaging you're hurting the um, safe, you know, you're affecting the safety and health of others. And she said it's a single family home, so no one was affected. 
or damage. So they've now added this. I, I suspect we're not going to see a lot of intentionally causing property damage. So hardship declarations can be challenged, um, but what I think the top line thing to understand is that uh, tenants in New York City have a right to counsel. Um, so uh, I, I, I don't know how many we're going to see of these challenges in New York City, um, but uh, the will the law will develop based on a tenant having an attorney, which is always a good thing. If you're upstate, tenants should reach out to their local legal aid offices. Um, we're hearing that uh, the only um, challenges to hardships that we are hearing about at the moment are outside of New York City. Um, and uh, uh, some judges up there, uh, and I, I uh, they have these town and village courts where to be a judge, you don't have to be a lawyer. And so some of those town and village courts are just setting uh, motions down without even asking for papers. It's the wild, wild west out there, but that's not happening in New York. Um, if the court after hearing, and at the hearing, the tenant bears the burden of proof of showing hardship. If the court finds there was no hardship, the case will move forward. Um, uh, if the court finds the hardship, um, the court puts a, state, a stop to the case, um, but uh, the court may tell the tenant to apply for uh, rent relief. Um, some of the things that were put into this law are uh, to address um, uh, concerns that mainly upstate legislators had um, because their constituents tell them how terrible tenants are. Um, I don't think there are many cases where tenants are moving forward and saying I have a hardship, um, but uh, haven't done anything to apply for rent relief. Um, anyway, but uh, to the extent that tenant exists, that tenant can be told to apply for rent relief. Um, just this is always been the case. If a tenant is approved for um, emergency rent relief and the landlord accepts the money, the tenant can't be evicted for non-payment of rent for the months covered by the approval. Uh, the tenant can't be evicted in a no-cause eviction or in any other holdover case, but the tenant can be evicted if they owe rent in the future or if the um, ERAP payment didn't cover all the months owed. Um, if the tenant is approved and the landlord doesn't accept the money, uh, the tenant can't be evicted for non-payment of rent for the months covered by the approval. Um, the only exception would be uh, if the landlord agrees to waive all the money. Now that wouldn't be a non-payment because non-payments are about money. Um, but we think there might be cases where you have a like a no defense holdover and the landlord says, I just want my my apartment back. Um, I don't I don't want the money. I'm, I'm fine with not getting the money. Um, so we think that if that goes in front of the court, the way the law is written, those tenants uh, might still face eviction. Um, the new law uh, in the ERAP section, as I said, added uh, protections for tenants in places where localities didn't opt in. Um, for your information, that's Rochester, Monroe County, Onondaga County, uh, City of Yonkers, Town of Hempstead, uh, Islip, Brookhaven, and Oyster Bay. Those last three are on Long Island. Um, uh, there was uh, a couple of judges who were, um, in my opinion, twisting themselves into a pretzel to come up with an interpretation that said applying for rent relief didn't protect any case that was pending on the day the law was signed. That's not what the language said, but there were three judges, including a former legal services attorney, um, who were um, who had had cases briefed in front of them and made clear that they were going to write bad decisions on that. So that's now been cleaned up. Um, if you've applied for ERAP, uh, you have a you have an additional stay. You have the hardship declaration stay, but you also have a stay on your case for applying for rent relief. Um, the law directs the agency to accept phone applications. The agency told us they were doing that. Um, but uh, but in case they in case they were not being truthful, now they have to. Um, and and the exception that was in the first law, um, which is nuisance or significantly damaging property, has been added to this law. 
So if a tenant um, is in the middle of a nuisance case, that case can move forward even if they applied for rent relief. And if the tenant is found to have committed a nuisance, even if they get ERAP, they can be evicted. Um, that is why it's incredibly important for every tenant who has a nuisance case uh, to be represented by an attorney, because once you're represented by an attorney, frankly, it's hard to win these cases for landlords. So Tenant Safe Harbor Act, um, I, I don't know how, we've, I think we may have talked about it before. Um, because of the moratorium, I don't know how many people have used this um, law, um, but it was passed in uh, May of 2020. And um, just, I, I think everyone who's here understands that um, when you go to housing court, uh, the judgment that landlords ask for are possessory judgments which means if a tenant doesn't satisfy that judgment, the landlord gets possession. That's how evictions happen. Um, if a tenant gets evicted, they still have this judgment out there and a landlord can easily go to small claims court and get a monetary judgment and have all the consequences of monetary judgments, which aren't great, which are uh, garnishing of wages, um, attaching bank accounts. Um, but that's that's, what it means to be um, at risk uh, to, for when a landlord seeks a judgment in housing court. Um, what the Tenant Safe Harbor Act says is that if the landlord, so it's only non-payment cases, and if a landlord is suing for rent between the months, for rent that is between March 7th, 2020 and January 15th, 2022, and the tenant can show that they were financially harmed because of COVID or during this period of time, the landlord can get a money judgment, but cannot get a possessory judgment. So the landlord, uh, you know, as I said before, right? Landlords can always get mon monetary judgments. It sort of skips the tenant being evicted and then the landlord getting a monetary judgment and goes straight to monetary judgment, but allows the tenant to remain. Um, this becomes important um, if you have a case where the tenant owes rent um, uh, more than the ERAP payment and you're struggling to get a one-shot deal because of future ability. Um, uh, the other thing to understand about this is that uh, the, this, uh, well, a couple of things. If a tenant has filed a hardship declaration, um, that, is, that is a rebuttable presumption that they have suffered a hardship. Also, if they've been uh, applied for ERAP, that is something the court will take into consideration as proof of suffering a hardship. So if you have someone who will have difficulty showing what their income was pre-COVID and post-COVID, but uh, they like someone who's uh, uh, worked under the table, but they've been approved for um, ERAP, um, that proof will be good enough to get this um, uh, uh, access to this defense. Um, uh, the other thing to know is that this law lasts um, after January 15th. So this is a defense, think of it as this law is forever. It is a defense anytime money is sought for the, for the time period between March 2020 and January 15th, 2022. So if in two years uh, a tenant is facing a non-payment case for, let's say, December 2021 is one of the months accounted uh, in that for that month, the tenant will have the defense, even though we're two years away from uh, the end of the COVID uh, covered period. And then I just wanted to go through the latest numbers for ERAP. This is as of last week. I think we're going to get numbers uh, um, this week, hopefully. Uh, as, you, as you see, it's uh, as of September 14th, so hopefully we'll get something uh, today or tomorrow. Um, the total applications are 205,000. 205, um, we've heard that the agency thinks that they have enough money to cover uh, 215,000 people. Um, they have either paid out or obligated $1.5 billion. Um, of that amount, the amount that has actually gotten into the hands of landlords, um, here it says it's uh, 30,000 um, households and almost 400 million 
um, uh, payments that have gone out the door in a letter that the um, uh, governor sent to Treasury to ask for more money. Uh, it, that letter said uh, the number is up to 517 million out to the landlords. Um, because we do not have a program that allows payments directly to tenants when landlords don't cooperate, there is a way the agency decided that they would, uh, they, they've been struggling to, uh, they've been struggling to find landlord applications even when the landlord has applied. And so uh, when you hear this number of 90,000 where the tenant side has been found eligible, but, the, but there's no information on the landlord, that doesn't mean the landlords haven't cooperated. In fact, I think a lot of those landlords have cooperated. There's um, a real challenge, there's been a real challenge. Uh, the agency has had a real challenge. They're now saying reconciling the landlord's application to the tenant's application. I have some ideas of why that is. Um, I also think that in some, some of the um, uh, uh, applications that fall into this category are applications of tenants who, I mean, we all know this, right? Like tenants who did not have access to good contact information for their landlords. Um, maybe their way of interacting with their landlord was to was through the super. And so when asked for their landlord's uh, contact information, first number, which of course is not so useful um, in order to uh, uh, actually get a hold of a landlord who can fill out an application. Um, so uh, so this this ninety thousand category is not non-cooperating landlords. Um, and that's the number that is quickly, uh, that's where you're seeing at least 10,000 land, new landlords getting money almost every week, which is how we got from uh, 400,000, 400 million last week to 500 million this week. Um, so that amount, the 90,000 um, households where the tenants have been found eligible, um, that's like $1.17 billion. Um, of, of rent relief. Um, and all of this is incredibly important because um, under the um, statutes that created these programs, there were two, it's the appropriations bill from last December and the American Rescue Plan from last March. Um, there is a mechanism for the Treasury Department after um, September 30th to reallocate money from jurisdictions that have uh, not spent their money to jurisdictions that have spent um, all of their all of their money, um, and so uh, we're very clearly uh, we've hit that number in terms of obligated and or paid, um, and uh, uh, in, you know there's been some concerns that like we're cheating because we have this obligated category that's so large. Um, but the administration uh, or the, the agency told us yesterday that they think that by just September 30th, their disbursements will have met the threshold, um, which is 65% of the uh, payments for ERAP-1, which is about $1.1 billion. So um, uh, as challenging as ERAP has been, um, in fact, we are now one of the best programs in the country, um, uh, but that doesn't mean we aren't still trying to fix uh, immense, uh, immense problems uh, with the program. Um, and I'm also happy to talk about what we know about the program and if people have questions about the program.